activate. This is Living Power with Dan Hurst. So, Jesus has been arrested. Last Sunday, we studied that, the, uh, the arrest and how um, Judas came and betrayed Jesus. Uh, and all of this has happened. Everything that we've been studying over the past, seems like months, uh, all happened within just a few hours. And now Jesus has finally been arrested and taken away. Before he was taken away, though, <clears throat> he was talking to his disciples that this was uh, maybe an hour before, two hours before this happened uh, that we're studying today. Uh, and he says to, uh, he, he's, he's explaining things to his disciples, what's going to happen, what to expect, what's going on. And Simon Peter is, is, just interrupts him, basically. And in John chapter 13, this is what Peter says. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered him, where I'm going, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow afterward. Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. And Jesus answered, and he said, will you lay down your life for me? Truly, truly, I say to you, the rooster will not crow till you have denied me three times. Now, Jesus knows what's coming. He knows what to expect. He knows what's going to happen. He knows what's going to happen with Peter also. And he tells Peter this, and Peter's just got to think, Lord, you don't really know. You don't know how, how devoted I am to you, how, how committed I am to you. I, I have chosen to follow you. You are my Lord. You are, I mean, Jesus, uh, Peter said these words. You know, you're the Christ, you're, you're, you're God, you're the Messiah. He knew all of those things, and he said those things to him. And he says, I'm, I'd lay down my life for you. And Jesus said, Peter, you're going to deny me three times before the rooster crows, implying that tonight you're going to deny me three times. And Peter must have thought, well, Jesus, you, you, you kind of lost it here. And I'm going to prove to you that I'm committed to you. So what happens then is the soldiers come and they arrest Jesus. Um, and, and the disciples flee. The disciples take off running, all but two of them. And we see that in John chapter 18, starting with verse 12. So the band of soldiers and their captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. First, they led him to Annas, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had advised the Jews that it would be expedient that one man should die for the people. Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he entered with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter stood outside at the door. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to the servant girl who kept watch at the door and brought Peter in. The servant girl at the door said to Peter, "'You also are not one of this man's disciples, are you?' And he said, "'I am not.'" Now the servants and officers had made charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing and warming themselves. Peter also was with them, standing and warming himself. And then we drop down to verse 25. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself, so they said to him, You also are not one of his disciples, are you? He denied it, and he said, I am not. One of the servants of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, said, asked, Did I not see you in the garden with him? And Peter again denied it, and at once the rooster crowed. Now, we can look at a number of different passages in the different Gospels and kind of a surmise and, and kind of get a, a, an understanding of, of, of what happened that night because it, they, they were told this and, and uh, they understood what happened, and Peter, I'm sure, explained a lot of it, certainly to Matthew. And so there was this, this uh, overall picture that Peter just got more and more heated. He got more and more upset. And by the time, by the third time he had denied him, he was actually cursing. And he was, he was so upset about it. Now, next week we're going to begin looking, well, we're actually looking at a, at a trial today, but uh, one of these six trials. Um, but in order to understand what happened with Peter, we're, we have to understand the context of this first trial. So let me give you a little historical background because it will help you uh, understand. The religious trial, and there were three of them, but this religious trial essentially began immediately uh, as, as soon as Jesus was arrested. 
they tied him up and they hauled him off to this uh, to Caiaphas house now not the temple a lot of people get this confused and they think that he's hauled off to the temple or he's hauled off to to a court or something he, he actually went to the house of the high priest and so he's hauled off immediately and uh, the, the words first they led him to Annas which is recorded here in in uh, in this passage in John 18 uh, gives us information that is not in any of the other Gospels. They, in the other Gospels just talk about him being taken uh, to Caiaphas. But first he was taken to Annas. Now, Annas had been appointed high, peace, a high priest by Quirinius, and uh, that was back uh, in 6 AD. It's around probably 33 AD now. Uh, there's some debate whether it was 30 AD or 33 AD. It could have been 29 AD. I think it was 33 AD. But back in 6 AD, uh, Quirinius appointed Annas as the high priest. Now, according to Jewish law, Jewish uh, religious law, once uh, someone was appointed high priest, they were high priest for life. But the Romans didn't want that to happen because they uh, wanted to avoid the concentration of power in one person. So they kept appointing new high priests all the time. And they, but they didn't want to upset the apple cart too much. So they appointed, in this particular case, they appointed the high priests who were um, actually Annas' sons. And so all of his sons had become high priests. And now Caiaphas, who was his son-in-law, was the current high priest. As a matter of fact, you'll see in that passage, it said this year, in that particular year, it was Caiaphas who was the high priest. So they kept appointing new high priests all the time. But the Jews understood Annas to be their high priest and so that's the way they treated it and so he was um, uh, Annas who was who had been su uh, succeeded by his five sons and his son-in-law <clears throat> was still pretty much in charge and kind of ran things uh, behind the curtain so to speak and so apparently there was this preliminary investigation carried out by him before Jesus formal religious trial which was going to be done by Caiaphas now, it seems most likely that this first inquisition by Annas was for the purpose of the religious leaders to assess the situation and to determine how they would proceed now that they had Jesus in custody. Remember, they had been wanting to arrest him for a long, long time, and now they finally have him in custody, and they, um, they need to make sure that they've got all their ducks in a row to make sure that they can get through this trial quickly and, uh, and take care of Jesus. The fact that they went to Caiaphas' house, which was also Annas, Annas also lived there, indicates that it was by design, and it would explain why Annas was awake and ready to uh, meet them. Remember, uh, this took place in the wee hours of the morning, somewhere around 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, somewhere around that, so obviously everybody else is in bed, but Annas was awake, and they were, they were ready. They were expecting Jesus to be arrested. They knew, I mean, let's face it, he had been betrayed by Judas, and so they knew that, uh, that, uh, that Jesus was coming in that night. They were going to bring him in, and so they were ready for him. So Peter and John follow the arrest party to the house of Annas. Now, I say it was John. Uh, but we're not really told that. We just said that it was uh, another disciple. But apparently it was a disciple who had some connections to that level of authority. Remember, it says that he knew the high priest. That, that's what the Scripture says. Now, the reason I say it was John is this. Remember, John, this particular John, was his mother was Salome. She was the sister of Mary, the mother of Jesus, and therefore was equally related to Elizabeth. Remember when Mary and, and Elizabeth... Mary went to live with Elizabeth and when she was pregnant, and Elizabeth was also pregnant with John the, the baptizer. So, so Salome was related to, uh, to Elizabeth also, and Elizabeth was married to Zecharias, who was one of the priests. So, um, and by the way, he was also the one that proclaimed that Jesus was the Messiah. So that would have given John, I think, the connection uh, in and access to the household. So it was John, I think it was John, that went with Peter. We also see Peter and John together so many times throughout the Bible, so it just makes sense to me that that's, that's who it was. If it was John, it's interesting that he had no qualms about going right into the courtyard uh, to determine what was going on with Jesus and was probably known as one of Jesus' disciples. Uh, after all, they'd been uh, very public for the past three and a half years. But Peter was not connected. 
He, he didn't have that, that level of entry to that, to that uh, religious authority. And so he had to wait until he received permission to come inside. So we don't know how John got permission for Peter. It, it may have not been an issue at all. It may have just been one of those things where he just simply said, hey, he's with me. Uh, or he may have had to explain more in depth, which may have triggered uh, the questioning by some of the people in the, in the courtyard. And th- the interesting thing about the questions that were posed to Peter is that there's no indication that he was in danger. Uh, they just said, aren't you, one of, aren't you one of his disciples? The disciples weren't arrested, remember? It was Jesus that was arrested. They just wanted Jesus. They didn't care about the disciples. But they questioned, aren't you, aren't you one, of, one of his disciples? And apparently, Peter felt threatened by that. Um, before we criticize Peter too harshly, though, remember that besides he and John, all of the other disciples had, had fled. They were nowhere to be found. They were in hiding. Nevertheless, Peter denied being connected to Jesus three times. How could this leader of the disciples, who'd come up with this outstanding conclusion that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, the one who just hours earlier had promised to stand by Jesus no matter what, even if it meant prison or death, how could this guy betray Jesus? I mean, he had even taken out a, a, a sword or a, or a knife or something and, and, uh, and stood in the way of a band of soldiers to defend Jesus. And now all of a sudden, a servant girl says, aren't you one of them? And he says, no, I'm not one of them. Peter had followed Christ as, as, as Christ was led to the head priest's house, and he may have been standing in the doorway where he could actually see Christ. The very same Lord who had proclaimed that he had proclaimed so much loyalty to. The very same Lord that he had proclaimed that he was willing to go to prison and to death for. Now his first opportunity to stand for the Lord was here. And (laughs) this little servant maid says, aren't you one of them? And did Peter boldly proclaim Christ? Absolutely not. What he did was to react in his humanity. His survival mode kicked in, if you will. It was like, ah, uh, no, uh, that's not me. I'm, I'm not one of those guys. And, you know, I can't help but think that many of us do the same thing on Monday morning when we walk into the office and we check Christ at the door and we're the same as everybody else in the building. We are saying the same thing that Peter did when he denied knowing Christ at that fire. We act out of self-preservation because our Christianity might make it hard for us to function in a secular world. And I understand where you're coming from. We've all been in those situations. Some of you work for the government, and you know how difficult it is for you to stand for Christ in that kind of setting. Oh, no, there's separation of church and state. You can't be a Christian here. Well, you can be a Muslim. Why can't you be a Christian? You know, we, we, we don't understand what authority we actually have that's been given to us. And then we get in situations that are awkward because we're around somebody who, 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 we, who doesn't believe in Christ or somebody who thinks that Christians are a bunch of nuts. And so, you know, we don't want to cause any, you know, any, we don't want to cause any friction, and so we just back off. We just stay quiet. We're not going to stand for Christ when we're given an opportunity. I don't think that you have to be obnoxious. You know, I don't think there's, we're not supposed to be antagonistic. There's nowhere in the Bible that teaches that. But we are to stand for Christ, aren't we? Then why don't we? And suddenly we realize something very unique here in this story of Peter. Peter acted like he was the one who was on trial. And in a way, he was. He blew it. He had an opportunity to stand for Christ, and he failed intentionally. Perhaps when we think about our own response to questions about our faith, we can sympathize with Peter. How often, or has it ever happened in your own life, that you have been embarrassed to admit you were a Christian or a follower 
of Christ or felt it was just not the time to really bring it up or felt like it just just wasn't appropriate at this time for me to talk about this even though there was the opportunity how often have we been afraid of what others might think of us if they knew that we prayed and studied the Bible and that we believe this spiritual stuff you see we're a lot like Peter we all promise great things for God but sometimes we fail to deliver we we all at times weaken in the face of opposition how do you feel when that happens embarrassed that you were embarrassed ashamed that you were ashamed Guilty that you let Christ down? Something happens, and it's explained in Luke, in this story with Peter and the three denials. Luke chapter 22 says, And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And Peter remembered the saying of the Lord, how he had said to him, Behold, the rooster crows today. Before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. I can't imagine what was going through Peter's mind at that time. I mean, just to know that you have just denied Christ three times, and then Christ standing there, being bound, he's all tied up, and he looks at you and sees you. I've often wondered what Peter saw in Christ's eyes when the Lord looked at him after that rooster crowed. Whatever it was that Peter saw rocked him to the bottom of his soul. It revealed his failure. It revealed his failure. It revealed his failure to depend on Jesus, to trust Jesus. That Jesus was capable of doing what Jesus said he could do. That is what it really means to rely on ourselves instead of Christ. We're so concerned about a situation or something that's going on in our lives that we essentially take it upon ourselves to handle the situation. We're saying that we don't trust Christ to meet our needs or to take care of us. Oh, we say it but we don't really, really believe it. That we don't believe that Jesus can or will keep the promises that have been made in the Bible. I actually think that what Peter saw in Christ's eyes that night, I think what he saw was not guilt or shame. I think what he saw was love and mercy and forgiveness for the denial I mean after all Christ knew it was coming Christ knew it was going to happen he saw he saw ahead he knew it was coming and when Peter finally realized what had happened and he looks into Christ's eyes I think there was something in Christ's eyes that said I knew this was going to happen and I forgive you let me tell you something in your own life When you deny Christ, when there are those times when you just don't take the stand that you need to take, when there are are those times when you you don't focus in on really doing it Christ's, Christ's way, when there are opportunities to exalt the Lord, when you fail at those times, do you know that God already knew that was going to happen? He already knew that. He knew that a million years ago. And did it change his love for you? Absolutely not. I mean, let's face it, if Christ knew that you were going to deny him at some point in your walk with him, um, and and that you were going to reject him, wouldn't, don't you think in human terms that you would have said, I'm not dying for him. He's going to reject me. No. He loves you more than you love your rejection. Christ loves you more than you deny him. Christ's love is bigger than your rejection of him. And so I think that Peter 
saw this in Christ's eyes, and it, it suddenly brought it all home to him. I believe that what he saw was this love and mercy and forgiveness and the strength that was his to call on if he would only do it. And it was then, I think, that Peter began to understand. I think that became a significant turning point in Peter's life. Because it was at that point, we don't have any record anywhere else of Peter where it says that he went out and wept bitterly. There was a breaking point in Peter's life, and this was it. A turning point where he finally recognized that it wasn't about him. I can do this. I will stand for you. I will be strong. I will follow you to death. I will do this. I will do that. And finally he realized, I say those things, but I'm not that. There has to come a point in our lives where we get to that point where we recognize we're not as cool as we think we are. We're not as strong as we think we are. We're not as powerful as we say. I'm going to follow Christ. I'm going to stand faithful to him. I'm going to walk by Christ no matter what. Yeah, you could say it. But there comes a point where we, like Peter, recognize we can say it all we want. But the truth of the matter is that we fail. Well, why do I say that this was a turning point in Peter's life? I want you to compare what happened. This turning point came in Peter's life beginning when he realizes his failure. He understands what's going on. The next time that we see Peter is Peter's realization that Christ has risen from the dead. He runs to the tomb, remember? And he discovers that Jesus is alive. The Jesus that he had denied, who goes to the cross and dies, Peter had to have been going through some horrible guilt during that time. I mean, basically, three days of guilt. Three days of this horrible guilt. I denied him. I didn't stand up for him. It may be if I had stood up for him, he wouldn't be hanging on a cross now and then buried in a tomb going through all that guilt and then all of a sudden three days later he's running toward the tomb because he's something's happened he doesn't know exactly what and he gets there and he discovers that Jesus is alive and then shortly after that there's this discovery that he really is alive and he talks with him and then uh, you know then a few days later just a, a few days later just a few weeks later all of a sudden something happens to Peter and the rest of the disciples and the followers they are empowered with the Holy Spirit Now, I want you to compare this Peter of this story, the one that denied Christ, with the Peter after the Holy Spirit. Uh, It's explained in the book of Acts. Here we see a guy who was afraid to take a stand for somebody that he believed in. But after the Holy Spirit comes into his life, we see Peter standing in the streets of Jerusalem making statements like this. He's in Jerusalem where they crucified Jesus, where he denied Jesus. Now he's standing in the streets saying things like, God has raised this Jesus to life and we are witnesses of the fact. And later on he says, Therefore let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified both Lord and Christ and later on he says you killed the author of life but God raised him from the dead we are witnesses of this does that sound like the Peter at the courtyard that was asked if he was a follower of Christ and yet it was what happened what was the change in his life the Holy Spirit gives us a boldness to live and speak truth in a dark and angry world. There's a boldness that comes. It's just part of what the Holy Spirit does. And that's what gives us the courage to stand in those times when we feel threatened or challenged for our faith. And you are going to have to draw on that power of the Holy Spirit this week. Some of you will have to draw on that power today. There are going to be things that happen in your life that challenge your faith. And you're not going to be able to stand on your own like Peter was trying to do. 
The only way that you can handle that, the only way that you have the strength and the courage and the boldness to face those times is through the power of the Holy Spirit living inside of you. On behalf of Dan Hurst and the Open Class, 